for you, this class will not meet next Thursday morning. Okay, midterm break gives you guys a chance to catch up with your reading. Um, and today we are going to be talking about the basis for ethics. Last week we talked about authority in Christian ethics and talked about especially Old Testament um, and how that related to Jesus somewhat. I'm going to touch on some of those things again today because overlap as we move into new areas is important. And then today as I talk about basis for ethics, I'm going to get into the first major sort of uh, schema or... Uh, approach to doing ethics, which is, the, it's good for you to learn new words, teleology, which is goals ethic, making ethical decisions based upon the goals you want to achieve. It's the one that is most common in our world today, and so we're going to start with that one, even though it's not necessarily the oldest one. Um, the, uh, the, we will deal today with uh, basis for ethics and teleology in two weeks when we meet again. We'll talk about duty ethics, or what's called deontology. <coughs> That is, you have people who make their own decision based upon the fact they think there is a law or there are laws or sets of rules or duties that they must fulfill. Um, and then on November 12th, we will look at the third approach, general, broad sort of stroke approach to doing ethics, and that is virtue ethics, having to do with uh, what, what virtues should I have as a person and how do my ethical decisions both reflect that and what do they create in me. So it has to do with personal virtues. Um, then the conclusion on November 19th, and I'll probably touch on this as we go along, I will focus especially on how those three major approaches, teleology or goal ethics, deontology or duty ethics, and then virtue ethics, which is all called, also called aradiology, as you'll see today, um, they, how those come together, I believe, both in the writings of the Old Testament which is not nearly what most people think. Most people think the Old Testament's all about just rules and laws. That's not the case. And then especially how that is reflected in Jesus. And Jesus, his, um, his adaptation really of, you know, Jesus did not change the Old Testament. He fulfilled part of it so that we're no longer necessarily under those rules. But it's not like he started all over again or wiped it all out. In fact, I think one of the things I want to do right now is to start with that, because somebody asked me a question who was here last week, um, not here right now, about Old Testament, New Testament. How do we decide what of the Old Testament we obey? Because we no longer, you know, stone practicing homosexuals, <laughs> hopefully. We don't, we don't, you know, condemn to death children who are disobedient to their parents. We don't round up heretics you know, and, and toss them off cliffs or set them on fire or whatever. So, and yet, there are rules in the Old Testament about all of those things. So how do we decide what we follow in the Old Testament and what we don't? So this is kind of an addendum to the discussion last week. Um, quite simply, the Old Testament law or rules are of two very clear types. There are the moral laws. Don't kill, don't steal, don't lie about your neighbor, don't commit adultery. Okay? And... In the Old Testament, there are 613 commandments. There's not just 10. There's 613. They're called mitzvot in the Hebrew. So 613 mitzvot. The moral commandments, the things that have to do with moral conduct in the Old Testament, are still, still impinge upon us today. We still have to obey those. Just because Jesus came doesn't mean it's now okay to kill people with nearly. Now, there are circumstances in which we might say that it's... it's unfortunately necessary, um, just war theory or in defense of your family or whatever, okay? Uh, you know, there's some, some serial killer who's attacked your family and the only alternative you have to protect your family is to defend them by, you know, by killing the person. Uh, even our legal system will say that there is such a thing as justifiable homicide, okay? So we have conditions like that. But generally speaking, the moral rules of the Old Testament still apply to us. But the majority of the Old Testament rules are called the priestly law. I mean, there's a number of different names for them. The Deuteronomical laws, there are other things. They were the, the rules or laws that were set in place in the Old Testament in order to tell the Jewish people how their religion needed to be structured and how they needed to conduct the, the Jewish religion. Um, they are things like the dietary law. You can't eat anything pork, you know, no bacon, no shellfish, so lobster and... and, and shrimp are out, camarones. I sometimes have to stop and think what's the English word because I'm so used to saying camarones. Um, all of those kinds of things. And also things like 
defines the kind of stool you're allowed to sit on, uh, or what kind of bowl you should eat out of. And, you know, no woman should be touched during her period for a time after that, and all kinds of stuff. We are not under the, that anymore because, for one thing, we're not Jewish. I mean, that's the simple version. We do not obey the laws that were given for how the Jewish religion should be set up. Jesus came, said, I came not to do away with the law, but to fulfill it. And so all of those requirements about what it means to be righteous in a, in a legalistic, and I will use that word there, um, Old Testament Jewish law kind of way, we are made righteous not by those rules, by, by using those to set up and follow our religious uh, practices, but rather we are made righteous by Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for us. So Jesus basically satisfied all those requirements. So if we truly do accept him as our Savior and our Lord, and we seek to be obedient to him, then all of those priestly law requirements that were given to set up the Jewish faith are fulfilled in him, and we no longer have to obey those. Eating bacon is not considered a sin. All right? But we still have the moral laws. That's where we draw the line. Jesus came and fulfilled all of the requirements of the priestly law, the religious requirements, the systematic religious requirements. And we no longer have to be concerned about those. We do, however, still have to maintain a moral law. Um, the one of the Ten Commandments that people sort of have questions about is remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. You know, okay, so that the Ten Commandments primarily are are moral laws, you know, they're ethical laws for the most part. Well, that's one about our relationship with God. And God gave the, um, and Jesus dealt with that one probably more than any of the other commandments because he was always being challenged. You know, why do you let your followers pick grain and eat it on a Sabbath? Why do you heal people on the Sabbath? All of these kinds of things. And Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. What that means is the Sabbath commandment is not supposed to be this onerous rule. It was given so that human beings, for the first time ever, had permission not to have to work seven days a week, you know, 10 or 12 hours a day, or who, you know, however much the people in authority said you had to. God gave as a gift to the Hebrew people this idea that one day a week, you don't have to work. You can focus instead on your family, on study, on especially your relationship with God. That's the primary focus because it was God who gave the Sabbath. And so that was intended to be a gift. And when the Pharisees tried to turn it into this burden, Jesus smacked them upside of the head any number of times and say, you guys really don't get what the Sabbath is all about. So even though that's the one of the rules, it sounds like it might be a, a, a religious law, not a moral law in the Ten Commandments. It is one that Jesus made a big point of saying, this really is a moral issue. It's a moral issue in your favor. It's a gift to you. Not something like you can't eat bacon or God's going to be mad at you. Okay? Does that make sense? In terms of how we divide those things. Again, somebody had had a question about that because I, I talked about, you know, that from Jesus' time on, we don't follow all of the Old Testament rules. We don't do that. But it didn't sort of explain how you tell the difference. So I'm, I'm a little confused. So why was the day changed from a Saturday, a Friday night to Saturday? That was the Sabbath. Right. To Sunday, what yeah. difference does it make? Why did why was it why was why was it changed? Right. Why did we start what they called in early times the Lord's Day rather yes. than the Sabbath? And of yeah. course, Sabbath is Saturday. The Spanish word for Saturday is sabado. Okay, that's the same root. It's the Sabbath. The reason, very simply, is because um, the early Christians who were all Jews, the very first Christians mm -hmm. were all Jews, and they still worshipped on on Saturday. In fact, we have an Acts that talks about Peter and, and um, John going up to the temple at the usual time of prayer, which means it, would, means it would have been Saturday. But then, two things. One, the early Christians really felt as though they wanted to do something to honor the day on which Jesus was resurrected, which was Sunday. It wasn't Saturday. And so they felt as though they wanted to, and so they would get together for a time of worship, and you know what, what got them in a lot of trouble, they called a love feast, a sharing together of a meal. Well, as more and more, in fact, the proportionate number of uh, Christians were no longer Jews. They became Gentiles, starting, you know, starting with Cornelius the centurion and his family, and then the Gentile church, but not only Gentile church in Antioch that Paul and Barnabas had. More and more and more of the Christians were Gentiles, and so they no longer had this historic, cultural, Old Testament, <coughs> biblical idea that you need to keep Saturday as a special day. And so they began to migrate entirely to the focus being on Sunday, which they had already begun to, 
to do special things on, in honor of the Lord's Day, the day he was resurrected. And so that transition, you know, it didn't happen all at once. Yeah. It, it moved over as the predominant number of Christians were now Gentiles and didn't feel that obligation to this happen. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. All right. So that's all sort of preclude uh, to, to preview, um, finish up some things last week. I feel like I should close in prayer. <laughs> All right. Um, we've looked at this slide. Ethics or moral philosophy is the branch of philosophy that investigates the questions, what is the best way for people to live, and what actions are right or wrong in particular circumstances. There are aspects of ethics called meta-ethics that deal in purely abstract kind of philosophical terms. You know, why do we believe there's a good and bad at all? You know, why, are, why is there such a thing as ethics? But ultimately, this boils down to asking the question, in any given circumstance, by what means do we decide what is right or what is wrong? And everybody does ethics. This is based upon the idea that everyone... <coughs> bless you. Bless you. That's, that's, the second one is... Gunshot. Is okay, good. <laughs> uh, that's all right. Uh, my wife's family, you know, they have yeah, to roll down the windows when they... So. Um, I could tell you stories from her that she told me. At some point in everyone's life, for instance, they begin to ask questions about the way they live their lives. For many, it's when they leave home and go to college, or leave home at all, and they start questioning all the things they grew up assuming. The religious values their parents had, you know, the ethical values, you know, they're all, all, all of these very pretty young people of the opposite sex now, and what do I do with that? You know, there are all kinds of things. You, quite often, it is a major time of transition in life where people begin to ask the questions. Like, is the way I've always been taught what I still believe? Is the way I have been acting still the way I should be acting? Is this the best life for me? Is this the best way for me to live? Or are there alternatives? Especially as people get older and they get introduced to other kinds of you know, new cultures, new religions, new groups of people, new whatever. They begin to question that. It's also true, and, and some of those processes are slow, where people just begin to absorb this and think about it and consider, okay, is my old way of doing it, my old ethical kind of standards, be they religious or whatever, are they still what I want to follow or should follow? Or is there some new idea now? In some cases, the change, the sort of uh, transition in ethical thinking happens, ha thinking happens because of some abrupt, even crisis, you know, a natural disaster, a death of someone that you love, um, a serious illness, a war. Sometimes those things cause people to step back and say, wait a minute, am I doing this the right way? Am I looking at it the right way? But everyone at some point will ask themselves ethical questions. They will ask themselves critical questions about their lives and how they're living them and whether, whether that is best or even what they want. Anytime those questions involve words like, good or bad, right or wrong, ought or ought not, what is just or unjust, anytime we ask those questions or use those words, those are ethical issues. And so the question we, we have for ourselves is, by what means, in what systematic, consistent way, ought we to make those decisions, rather than just kind of make stuff up as we go along? Now, uh, we would... Many people would say, and I would agree, that there are apparently some common sense kind of principles that apply to us making ethical decisions. Some things just seem to be widely understood to be common sense, although that may vary from one culture to the next. The principle of autonomy, that people should be allowed to be self-determining. I should be able to decide what's right for me, not somebody else shouldn't have to force that on me. The idea of the principle of utility, which we're going to talk about later, that is, how do I maximize pleasure and minimize pain? Um, the, the third sort of common sense principle is the principle of justice, that all people should be treated fairly and equally. As one utilitarian uh, said about, about government, everyone should, have, uh, should count as one and no more than one, for instance. That means everybody's equal. One person doesn't get, get to vote ten times and another person doesn't get to vote at all. When you talk about ethics as applies to government, this is the equity or principle of justice. And then the principle of sanctity of life, that there is a respect for all human life as sacred. Uh, a couple of times I've mentioned to Carolyn, you know, a TV show we watched. We were watching Bones the other night. You guys know Bones, the new season is there. Well, these Jeffersonian Institute is where these people work, and they're all forensic pathologists of one level or another. And so somebody gets murdered, and 
they spend like a million dollars <laughs> to find out who killed this person so they can be brought to justice. Uh, I mean, they'll, move, they'll remove part of buildings and bring them into their laboratory so they can examine them, or whole vehicles, or, you know, giant drainage tanks, or whatever. And they'll, they'll spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on a new piece of equipment to allow them to analyze, you know, some, some particular piece of evidence in order to figure out how this person was murdered and who did it. Well, why would they do that? See, the question is, what possible, I mean, the person's dead. We're not going to bring him back by doing, making all this effort and spending all this money and having a TV show about it. Uh, mm -hmm. Why do we do that? Well, embedded in all of that, embedded in our whole justice system about murder and assault and rape and all of those things, is an inherent sense of the sanctity and value of human life. The human life cannot be taken lightly, nor can it be violated through rape or, you know, uh, uh, assault without us taking it that very, very seriously as a society and going to almost unlimited expense to try to address that so that hopefully it doesn't happen again, right? That's, that's the reason why we will go so far. That's the reason why we spend so much money on, you know, homicide units around uh, the country and uh, countries, the various countries we come from, because of a sense that human life has a, has a value, a sanctity that is such that we don't let that go lightly. When someone takes a human life, and for instance, every other crime I believe has, except I think treason doesn't, but every other crime has a statute of limitations. After a certain period of time, if somebody is not caught and convicted of a crime, they no longer can be prosecuted. That's not true with murder. There is no statute of limitations on murder because the sanctity of life insists that we deal with that no matter how long it takes. But the question is, what if two or more of these ethical principles seem to be in conflict in the case, given case? How do we resolve this? Can you? There's a real obvious of those two uh, of those principles up there. Two of them are seen as in conflict in a, a very important cultural societal question that continues to be a challenge. Oh, abortion. I was going to say the death penalty. Okay, well, the death penalty, the sanctity of life versus, yeah. justice. you know, yeah. Yeah, versus justice. Well, the, uh, abortion, I think, is the one I was thinking of. The idea of autonomy, you know, I have a right to do with my body whatever I want, mm -hmm. versus the sanctity of life. But that's a human child. That's why, and they don't do it anymore, thank heavens, because they're not going to get anywhere with it. The argument about where does life begin, is it at conception, is it at birth, is it at you know, the point of viability, meaning if the baby were brought out of its mother right now, it could still survive. Um, that had to do with the conflict between autonomy and the sanctity of life. When does life actually begin, human life? So you can see very practically how these seemingly common sense principles can be in conflict. And somebody who holds the principle of autonomy more highly would argue that no, I have a right to do whatever I want with my body. Somebody who holds the sanctity of life more highly would say, no, the important thing is you're threatening to take a human life, whether that life has been born yet or not. You see the problem when we deal with what seem to be common sense principles. There are conflicts associated with that. And so what we need is an ethical theory, a general framework for moral decision making. That's not just what seems to make sense to a person or to a, a group of people or even to a whole society. I mean, there have been whole societies that held to what they thought was common sense principles that we would be, you know, absolutely horrified by. In Roman society, it was quite common if a, if a baby was born that wasn't the sex that you wanted or that had any sort of disability or didn't appear that though they would be everything you wanted them to be, it was considered perfectly acceptable to take the baby out and leave in the wilderness to die. That was not thought of as being a bad thing. That was natural, they thought. Obviously, and to them, that made, that made perfect sense, all right? Um, common sense principles are not always consistent over time and in different places. Yes? Isn't that kind of a, a natural, like you say, a natural thing? I mean, I see birds laying on the ground all the time that are deformed because the mother decides that they can't live a normal life since she pushes them out of the Right. Well, do we think that same thing applies to humans? No. No. See, that's the question. Yeah. That's exactly how the Romans and other societies that have felt that way. That's what the Nazis said. You know, they had a, a program of, and, and Ceausescu in Romania, 
you know, they, he, they warehoused any children with disabilities and didn't really care if they died. In fact, in some cases, encouraged their death, as did, you know, as did the Nazis. So there have been societies, even in the 20th century, cultures in the 20th century, who maintained that human life, the natural order of things, is that if it's not going to be 100%, then might as well get rid of it. Remember the movie Hawaii? I saw it as a kid, and I was so shocked because the baby was born with a red uh, birthmark on its face, and they immediately took the baby, and the, the doctor, whoever delivered it, was putting it in the water to drown it. And the priest said, we, you know, was horrified, was trying to save it. And they were like, what? They, so it's exactly, yeah. and that's, that was more um, current, yeah. you know, more current. Well, one of the things that Christians were known for, and, and <coughs> mostly thought well of, although you realize some people thought this was just really weird, was that when babies were abandoned, Christians in the first century would go out and bring them home and raise them as their own. That was one of the things that people who were a little more enlightened considered that a, you know, a sign of great moral you know, rectitude, of really a positive thing. But most of the people in Roman society considered that to be an aberration and, you know, and inappropriate. Um, Marvin? Maybe we should be doing that these days when we make the people have the babies that they don't want. See, the biggest problem is we're trying to impose our ethics and our morality on people who don't have it. And we're trying to force other people to do what we want. Don't get divorced, don't be homosexual, don't have a baby out of wedlock, don't die. You know, when you try to enforce what you believe on other people, you're going to have a lot of problems. Right. However, how do we make decisions about whether it's just our, and that's the whole point of this, you know, coming up with a, a general framework for ethical decision making. Uh, what if it's not just my idea? What if there is some greater truth to that? We're going to talk about uh, you know, moral uh, absolutism or uh, relativism a little bit later. Um, there are people who fight divorce because they believe that an unborn child is a living person and that the same kind of energy that we should invest in, in preventing people from being murdered, you know, adults from being murdered, or even that we invest in trying to find the people who did the murder, that we should invest the same thing in preventing abortion, because it is the taking of a life. And it's not just a matter, I will disagree with one thing, it's, it, it, sometimes it is, but it's not uh, always just a matter of us trying to make people do what we want. Um, that there, there are, I would maintain, and some people disagree with this, and we'll talk, that's what we're going to talk about later. Uh, I would maintain there are some things that are right and some things that are wrong. Some things that are true and some things that are untrue. Some are good and some are bad. You know, that's a moral absolutist kind of thing. And as Christians, we're pretty much obligated to believe that's true. And so the question is, if we believe that some things are good and some things are bad, and we see the bad being done, how do we advocate, you know, first, how do we decide whether it's good or bad? And then, how do we advocate for the good in such a way that does not become oppressive? but rather is encouraging of the proper ethical values. You know, that, that's a very legitimate question, okay? Well, let's keep going. One of the things that we need to realize as a basis for ethics is that all ethics is done from a particular point of view, which really speaks to what you, you just said. Um, when people answer the questions of ethics, they do so from some foundation, from some previous understanding or assumptions or uh, expectations. The ideas about what it means to live a good life, to do the right thing, have a lot to do with people's understanding about human nature. You know, whether life has purpose, what they expect about the future. Um, you know, we'll get into this in the, athe in the apologetics class as well. One of the huge problems with the new atheism um, is, or old atheism even, is that if you follow it to its logical conclusion, then there is nothing inherently more valuable about a, about a human being than there is by, about a tree that's a lie. And so if you believe that's true, if you come from that position, then what does that say about how you treat other people, how much you're willing to exert an, uh, an effort to try to take care of people? You know, uh, Nietzsche's philosophy, for instance, his nihilistic <coughs> philosophy, said basically uh, that all human beings have a natural will to power. And that if someone is powerful enough to be able to control a situation and to, and to be victorious over someone else, then that's natural. That's the way it should be. That's the whole principle that the Nazis took. That, that um, lesser peoples, quote unquote, the Jews, the handicapped, gypsies, um, Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, the list of people that they, they, they persecuted is a long one. All of them based upon the fact that these people are either 
either broken somehow, or they're stupid, or they're wrong, or they're evil, and because we're strong, we're in power, we have a right to do away with them. And they consider that ethically appropriate. So the issue of where you're coming from, and it was based much on uh, much of that on Nietzschean kind of philosophy. Where you're coming from, what your point of view is, significantly influences how you approach ethics. And we need to start with that kind of understanding today. A Christian who believes that all things come from God, and therefore, um, and particularly that people are made in the image of God, <clears throat> will look at human life very differently than a scientific materialist who believe that nothing is more than just the atoms that make it up. That all of creation, no matter what it is, is simply atoms in motion. That there are no ethical values higher than that. That's the reason that the new atheists have struggled so much to try to come up with some explanation for having a moral system of being moral people in the absence of any belief in supernatural or the divine. So what perspective you come from makes a huge difference. Now, Christian ethics is different, but it's related. It's different in that a Christian who believes all things come from God will answer ethical questions differently than, say, a scientific materialist. But it is not entirely different. Particularly, Christian ethics and other kinds of ethics, based, you know, the Hebrew ethics or the ethics based upon Greek philosophy or anything else, even what we would consider a, a completely off the wall kinds of ethics, like what the Nazis had, all of them are asking, the Nazis maybe didn't, are asking the same questions, but they have different answers. You know, what is the value of human life? Is a question that anybody who asks ethical questions will ask. And yet their answer will be very different based upon what perspective they have, what point of view they're coming from. Uh, a lot of ethical books, uh, ethics books, will talk about the stance that they take. You know, from what stance do they approach these questions? And we said last week that Christian ethics is rooted in the Hebrew prophets and uh, the, the Hebrew law, which called people to renewed covenant with God. And that that renewed covenant with God would be, uh, would re be reflected in their living with justice, kindness, and humility. And then later, Jesus picks up that same theme. Jesus did not start all over again. There is a continuum between the Old Testament message and the New Testament message. Jesus picked up all the truth of the Old Testament, most especially... That first and foremost, it is our relationship and love for God, and then our relationship to other people. That's basically what the Old Testament ethics was about. Now, Jesus didn't add as many rules, because as I say, he fulfilled most of the rules that we find in the Old Testament. But it's the same basic principle. That's what we talked about last week, to a great extent. Um, now, the Christian approach to ethical questions, based, based upon the Hebrew ethics... And they didn't call it ethics, they didn't have sort of a philosophical system of ethics, but they did have a very clear idea that your first obligation is to be in a relationship with God, and that should be reflected in how you treat other people. I'll give you uh, passages in a second. And then that was picked up by Jesus, um, and influenced by Greek philosophy along the way, with about three to four hundred years before Jesus. Significant influence in that regard. One of the most important ethicists that we have had in the Christian world has been uh, Augustine of Hippo, Hippo St. Augustine. You know, he was born in what's now Algeria. He was the Bishop of Hippo in North Africa. This was when North Africa was a center for Christianity. Not so much anymore. Um, and he lived from the mid-300s to the, like, 430, I think, um, A.D. And even though that was a long time ago, uh, Augustine was, is still today read as one of the most significant theologians and philosophers ever. In fact, he wrote the world's first autobiography. Um, and so there are a lot of ways in which Augustine was an extraordinary guy, and he actually didn't become a Christian until fairly late, um, I think in his early 30s. And so he is one we look to a lot. But as I said, the Hebrew prophets focused on the requirements of justice in relationship and reverence for God before everything else. And when I say justice, I mean all ethical questions. Justice, equality, all of those things. Micah 6, 8, one of my very favorite verses in, in Scripture, He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. What is that, other than say, relationship with God, and then live that out in your life, by how you treat other people, with justice, and with mercy, and with love. Okay? That's 
really the Hebrew ethic, you know, encapsulated in one verse. As I said, Jesus continued this, proclaiming that God was the focal point, but that God was actually open to all people, and in that way inaugurated a new covenant based, based on the old, but in reaction against a lot, you know, there was a reaction there against all of the immorality that, that was existed in that time, and, and Paul comes along and really affirms that opposition to immorality as being inconsistent with Christian life and obedience to God and belief in Jesus Christ. Um, now, Jesus did not invent this idea that non-Jews could come to God. From the very first, the call of Abraham, Abraham was promised several things. Abraham, we're talking Genesis 12 now, pretty early in the process, he's told, you know, if you follow me and do what I tell you, I will be your God and you will be my guy. And of you I will make a great people. I will give your people a land to call their own. And through you I will bless all peoples of the earth. So the promise that it would be available to everybody starts as far back as Abraham. And then it's that same thing, I will bless all peoples through you, is affirmed in Isaac, it's affirmed in Jacob, it's affirmed throughout the prophets, Jeremiah and others. And so Jesus comes along and basically just formalizes what had been a background understanding that it wasn't the Jews were the chosen people of God specially selected and had having special responsibilities as part of that but in Jesus they finally unfolded the plan that had been promised all along that it would be available to everyone and that along with the great mercy and grace that comes with God's love for us and his salvation of us we also have responsibilities this is Paul, not Jesus, but it's completely consistent with uh, Jesus. Paul said in Galatians 5, starting in verse 19, and he's, he's addressing this to a church in Asia Minor, a uh, church in Galatians. It would have been shared with other churches, but Paul, this is all the way through Paul, but this is pretty concise. This is what the Roman world looked like at that point. Now, the works of the flesh are obvious. Fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these that describe some churches today. I am warning you as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. So, if you are right with God in Jesus Christ, you will live a different kind of ethical or moral life. That's a consistent message throughout the New Testament. Not that those things are what save you. Not if you check off all the boxes and follow all the rules, then you're okay. But if you accept God in Jesus Christ, then you are expected to live differently. You are expected to have an ethical set of standards that the rest of the world may not understand. Um, and that's fundamental to the Christian walk. Um, the sermon series that I, I completed recently on um, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. And the whole long series was on what did Jesus command us to do. Now we're doing a series from Matthew 25 in which Jesus said, um, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. Uh, I was in need of clothing and you clothed me. I was in prison and you visited me. I was sick and you took care of me. I was a stranger and you invited me in. As much as you've done unto the least of these, you've done it for me. And he says to the ones who do those things, you know, come into the reward promised you from all eternity, and to the ones who called him Lord, but don't do those things, he said, depart from me, you accursed. And the lake of fire prepared for the devil and his demons, for I never knew you. And, and those people who didn't take care of the poor, and in doing so care for Jesus, are condemned to eternal damnation. So while you don't get saved by doing those things, if you don't do those things, it's a demonstration of the fact you don't really love Jesus. You, you don't really take him seriously. You have not really accepted him if you don't have some ethical standards that accompany that in your life. You understand that? And the New Testament is entirely about that. And it, that, that makes up for all the other... There are no other barriers that divide people other than that. Do you accept Christ and are you obedient in the way he told us to? You know... Um, also in Galatians, Paul said, There is no longer Jew, nor Greek, no longer slave, nor free, no longer male, nor female, but all of you are one in Christ Jesus. All the other sort of criteria that we apply don't fit after Jesus. You either accept Jesus or you don't, and you either are obedient to him and how you live ethically, or you're not. 
And the second thing makes a big difference. In an effort not to believe that we're saved by our own efforts, too many Christians have said, well, what you do doesn't really matter. Depart from me, you are cursed into the lake of fire, prepared for the devil and his demons. I think it matters. Marvin. On well, the other parables, the man was forgiven a huge sin, a, a, a debt, and then went up and grabbed someone who owed him a small amount and demanded and put him in prison. Then the Lord said, same for you. <laughs> yeah, I was <laughs> merciful to you, and look what you did, so yeah. Yeah. take he and his family and put him in prison. Yeah, you just didn't get it. That's, that's what it's all about. Yeah. And Jesus summed it all up in the two commandments to love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, the two. If you really love God, the assumption is the second will follow. If the second doesn't follow, then perhaps you didn't really love God. That's why there are consequences to that. Okay? Make sense? So, the basis for our ethics. The Greeks, we've talked about the importance of the Greeks. See, the Greeks had no sacred scripture. Even though the ethics of Hebrews began a long time before, the last of the eight Old Testament prophets, Malachi, was um, 50 years at least before Socrates, who really was the one who kind of launched the uh, ethical thought in, in a formalized way, or in the way we would understand it and see it uh, in Greece. They had no sacred scripture they could rely on, so they struggled with, okay, how else do we decide what's right and what's wrong? Some of them said, follow your own desire. But the problem with that is desires change. They change from day to day, and sometimes you think that, that the right ethical decision is to go after something you really desire, and then when you get it, you find out that's not really what you wanted. Ever had that happen to you? Yeah, okay, I can tell you stories. So desire is a very unreliable, you know, trying to satisfy our desires is very unreliable. And then some of them believe that they can make ethical decisions, uh, the right choice for what is good, based upon oracles or using magic to make decisions. But given the logic, the rationality of Greek philosophy, certainly starting with Socrates, but even before that, they very soon began to see that consulting oracles or using magic was really inconsistent and somehow irrational. Um, by the time of Jesus, for instance, uh, probably by the time of Socrates, almost 400 years earlier than that, most Greek people, had kind of just given up on the pagan deities, on the, the pantheon of gods they had. Because there was, for one thing, there was no upside. You couldn't have a relationship with those deities. There was no promise of eternal life because of them. The only thing you could do is try to keep them from hurting you. Because part of one of the characteristics of Greek deities was that they were always sort of teasing people, human beings, in order to see how they would dance. It's like putting, a, you know, putting an ant on a hot plate or something to see what, what they'll do. But there was no upside to it. And so people had pretty much gotten tired of that uh, before the time of Jesus, which is one of the reasons that so many of the Gentiles who existed, who lived during the time of Jesus, were very open to this new message about a God that you can have a relationship with. And, you know, a lot of God-fearing Gentiles, they were called, were very interested in Judaism before that, but they were unwilling to be because it was monotheistic. It was one God, and he made everything, and we could have a relationship with him. But most of the Greeks, especially, were unwilling to do that because to become a Jew, you had to cut off part of your body, if you're a man. And you couldn't eat bacon, for heaven's sake. You know? uh, and so a lot of the Gentiles would not become Jews, even though they were attracted to monotheism. When Jesus comes along, and all of those rules are fulfilled and not necessary anymore, there was a huge influx of Gentiles who really wanted monotheism. Well, because the Greeks, by the time of Socrates even, a lot of the Greeks really said, oh, this multiple God thing doesn't make any sense. In fact, Plato, the student of Socrates, believed there was one God. Now, it was kind of a deism, you know, that God was a force, but he didn't believe in multiple gods. Um, so, they could rely on oracles or use magic, but that didn't seem to be consistent or rational. They could emulate the ancient or Homeric heroes. They could, you know, they could see Achilles, for instance, as being the model that they should emulate. Or some of the gods, you know, the noble gods, um, the Hercules, or uh, Heracles in the Greek, uh, to see them as a model that you can live a noble and you know, wonderful life and make, <coughs> write about things if you model yourself after them. Or, and this was a huge new thought, a revelation almost, they could try to use reason, since they were big on reason anyway. 
They could try to use rationality or reason to determine the right choices that would lead to the good, and especially that would lead them to fulfill good goals. So, enter Socrates. Socrates died in 399 BC, so you get some idea, 400 years before Jesus. And his student Plato, and Plato's student Aristotle, these three are all linked. Uh, they differ in some things, but they have pretty much consistency. And then later on, the Greek philosophy, most especially Neoplatonism, which was an articulation of Plato later on by Plotinus and, and, and others. And then the Stoics came up with their sense of natural law. They said all human beings are under the same kind of set of rules. And we all recognize there are rules, and so therefore all people have some sense of a natural law existing in the world. Those two things, Neoplatonism and the natural law approach of the Stoics, became very influential in the development of Christian ethical approaches and systems. Um, Plato was very influential on Maimonides, I mentioned that before, who was the uh, 12th century Jewish scholar and philosopher. And Maimonides was very influential in Thomas Aquinas, um, and Thomas Aquinas became the author of the natural law, the Christian idea of natural law, which became the foundation of all Catholic um, ethics and a lot of other Christian ethics. So Neoplatonism carried down to affect the way Christians were doing ethical thought. Along with this idea, and natural law, the natural law theology, or natural theology, is what Aquinas was known for. Well, the Stoics had articulated natural law. And so you see the influence that the Greeks had. And all of this came down to us. The idea that reason is one of the things we need to use in helping us understand what is the right thing. Aristotle, more than anybody else of those, of those people, articulated in some detail. He wrote treatises. Um, the, his ethical treatises are, he coined the word ethics, you know, Greek word, um, to, to describe us making decisions. And, and Aristotle, very significantly, he was also a scientist. He was one of the first ones who really studied nature and then you know, recorded his, his studies. So Aristotle was influential in philosophy, Later on in religion and also in science, one of the most they still read Aristotle in almost in half a dozen different disciplines. Well, Aristotle said he looked at the world since he was an observant guy, and he said all things have a natural movement in one direction: trees grow up, apples fall down, rocks stay close to the earth; they don't jump up. All things have some natural movement and some natural direction that they are drawn to. And he said, so what is the natural direction that human beings are drawn to? Again, he didn't have, he wasn't influenced by Hebrew thought. He didn't have Jesus yet. So what is the natural thing that draw, what direction are humans naturally drawn in? What distinguishes human beings from all other creatures? What's unique about them? And he identified that human beings ultimately desire happiness. We're all trying to be happy. Now the word that he used, Brad, that we translate happy, actually meant a sense of flourishing, of well-being of being fulfilled is a better word for it, but we use the word happiness. Uh, in fact, Aristotle went on to say that ordinary people will have multiple goals at one time, but very few people are aware enough to realize that most of the things they want, most of the goals they have, they don't really want that thing. They want what that will give them. For instance, people have a desire for money. Well, money does... What's money? You can't eat it? You know, money is only a means to some other end. The same thing with power. Power by itself doesn't mean anything. It gives you the ability to access something you do want. And so he said on almost anything you can think of, people want something, they, they think this, this will constitute a good life for me, and they go in that direction, but in fact, they want what that will bring them. And ultimately, the one thing that is by itself the thing people desire, and that they think whatever else it is will give them, is happiness, is fulfillment, is a sense of flourishing, of well-being. And so he settled on happiness, um, or eudaimonia, as being the goal of humanity. And so ethics, for Aristotle, and then for other Greek philosophers, the seeking after happiness became the focal point for ethics. Now that doesn't always mean just getting pleasure, because there can be a fulfillment, a flourishing, a, a sense of satisfaction, even in some self-sacrifice, if by sacrificing yourself you accomplish some greater good and you feel as though, yes, that's the right thing, that gives you a sense of this you know, well-being. And so it's not just 
satisfying your appetites. That's not what he meant by that. Now, Aristotle again comes along and, and influences Christian ethics. And we can say, well, Christians aren't focused on happiness. We've got big, but remember, the word for happiness that we translate happiness means something more. It means flourishing, well-being, you know, fulfillment. But even though Christian ethics has a particular kind of orientation that may be somewhat different than some of the Greek stuff, I don't think any of us would say that it's not true that human, all human beings, Christian or not, want a sense of well-being, of happiness, of flourishing. Okay? That is consistent. The question is, how do we get there? You know, what constitutes the process? By what means do we make the decisions that lead us to what, what is a good life? What is that flourishing? What is that fulfillment? Augustine comes along, again, one of the most important of all Christian theologians at the uh, end of the 4th century, and philosopher, theologian, uh, author, and he agrees with Aristotle that seeking this fulfillment, this well-being, is consistent, that, that Christians go there too, that we want the same things. But he clearly defined that what constituted, what made that flourishing, that what sense of well-being was very different. And Aristotle focused everything back to the idea of God, very, very much from the Hebrew idea and from Jesus. That he said, well, the ultimate well-being, the ultimate flourishing, comes by our relationship with the ultimate good, who is God. And that everything else comes out of that. And so for the last 1,700 years, generally speaking, Christian ethics has agreed that we're all looking for fulfillment, but which is how far Aristotle went. But Augustine picked that up and said, yes, but ultimately fulfillment will only be found if you first have a connection to the ultimate good, which is God, and that everything else follows that. And you can only evaluate the goodness of anything else or the goodness of your life if you first are in communion connection with the ultimate good, who is God. So Augustine advocated a radical monotheism, that God was the center of all things. In fact, he went so far as to say people should not love anything but God until their appetites have been so rightly <coughs> formed by relationship with God that they can do so safely. Because otherwise we're liable to have a love for something else and try to put it in place of God. So the starting point for Augustine, while he agreed with seeking, seeking happiness or seeking flourishing with Aristotle, he goes back to the Hebrew uh, writers and to Jesus and saying, ultimately, that starts with God. Love God first. Okay? Did you say Plato was the first monotheist? Well, he's not the first monotheist, but he, of, the, of those philosophers, he was clear in saying he believed there was only one divine being. So he came before Aristotle. So came in between. Oh, yeah, so Aristotle did not agree with that, or did he? Well, he, I, I don't recall Aristotle addressing that as specifically as Plato did. Okay. Um, and Aristotle was a little more scientifically oriented. In fact, if you look at, I, I have a class that I've done called What's Wrong with the World? And I stole that title from G.K. Chesterton. He has a book called What's Wrong with the World? And what I did was I started with the, with the Greek philosophers, particularly Plato and Aristotle. And if you take their idealism, and actually Aristotle was sort of an Epicurean materialist. I mean, he, 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 that's the science fist part of it, you know, looking at the physical world. Less emphasis on the spiritual and the supernatural. Plato's whole gig was beyond the physical world, there are these forms that are really the model on which all real things that we know are modeled. You know, that if you see you see a chair, somewhere there is a perfect form of a chair, and all other chairs, even though they look different, are all based on that. That's why we can recognize a chair as a chair, no matter if it's a, you know, if it's a stool or a, you know, a recliner or a, you know, whatever it is. So he, there was much more of an emphasis on the idealistic, beyond the physical world kind of thing in Plato, whereas Aristotle was much more a materialist. And what I, what I did in that class is I traced those thoughts down through uh, Augustine, who was very much Platonic, and um, Aquinas, who was very much Aristotelian. And the difference there is, uh, for instance, Aquinas would say, um, I believe that I might understand. In other words, belief comes before rational understanding. 
And Aquinas said, I understand that I might believe. He thought rational, rational determination came before our faith. And that's based upon the difference in Plato and Aristotle. And you can trace that on down through major philosophers and theologians down through history. And that difference between idealism and materialism, that there is something beyond the physical world or the focus is primarily, if not entirely, on the physical world, brings us down to and it helps us understand where we are today. Actually, some of that might be relevant to what we're doing in this class. I might go back and pull out my own notes. But, uh, so there was a difference in them. You know? Plato agreed with Socrates in most ways, but disagreed in some. Aristotle agreed with Socrates and Plato in some ways, but disagreed with them in some. Uh, that's why all three of I mean, if, if any of them had simply been repeating what their teacher had said, then we wouldn't know them as individual, but we do. Each of them had a distinctive kind of approach. So nothing new after Aristotle, I guess. Well, um, <laughs> there's some truth in that. I mean, Aristotle was so good and so complete that, yeah, in fact, some people have said that everyone after Aristotle was just commentary on Aristotle until, until Kant. And when Kant comes along, um, that everything after Kant is simply a commentary on Kant. Those are probably the two most important philosopher figures in history. Now, you could say, well, Socrates laid the foundation for a lot of that. Plato articulated, you know, so they're important. But probably Aristotle and Kant are the two great philosophers. And I'm not going to get into what all they said, because obviously that's huge. All right, so basis for ethics. It's important to note there is no one Christian approach to ethics. I mean, I've been talking about it as though, okay, here's what Christians say. But there is wide diversity among Christians in terms of their ethical approaches <clears throat> or their stance. As I say, a lot of ethical texts will talk about the stance, the point of view they come from. And while all Christians might say they come from the point of view of agreeing that God comes first and that that should be reflected in how we treat people, there is a difference in where they put their emphasis. You know, where do they put their, most of their weight? And that can have a very significant difference in what kind of ethical system comes out. Um, ethical approaches vary based upon historical, cultural, and doctrinal differences. We know there are differences in Roman Catholicism and, and Protestantism, but think about the fact that, that in the 11th century, the Roman Catholic Church and the Orthodox Churches, that is the Latin West and the Greek-speaking East, split. And they have very different approaches to everything. All right? um, and then... In the, the 16th century, you get the Protestants splitting off from the Catholics. And then Protestants, many, many sub-varieties. Sub I mean, there's some sub-varieties to Orthodoxy. There's, uh, there's the Eastern Orthodox, the um, Oriental Orthodox, etc. You know, and then various flavors of it, Armenian Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, etc. They all vary a little bit. But each of those reflect a historical event that historical and cultural divisions that led to very different approaches. For instance, modern theological uh, liberalism that, that we would often look at as heresy, that Jesus wasn't really divine, that the Bible wasn't really written by who's supposed to have written it, etc., etc., etc. The people who have advocated those things that, that evangelicals, myself included, would look at and go, sorry guys, you, you're wrong. That's heresy. It's always done by Protestants. There are no liberal, or they don't last long if they are, there aren't liberal, heretical theologians coming out of Catholicism or Orthodoxy. Because in Catholicism, they mean a central authority that decides, is that acceptable or not? And if somebody like a Hans Kuhn or somebody like that gets out of line, they censor their books, they threaten to excommunicate them, they remove them from their teaching positions, etc. So they control that. So you don't, they don't go very far in terms of that kind of heretical or, you know, uh, we would say not orthodox, not orthodox in the sense, the word orthodox means right belief. So orthodox in the sense of right belief. The Catholic Church doesn't allow it. The Orthodox Church just doesn't bother with those sorts of things. The Orthodox <coughs> Church is so much more oriented towards spirituality that the idea of having disagreements over sort of cognitive arguments about things, they go, what is wrong with you people arguing about those things? You know, that's their focus on the spiritual, upon icons as a focus of spirituality and all of that. They, just, they don't get into that, because, not because they have central authority that prevents it, like the Catholics, but because that's not how they think. So it's only the Protestants that create all those problems, particularly the German Protestants. If Bob Flinke were here, I'd be teasing him again. Because he, whenever I would say that in classes, he, he, because he's German. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, but you get the idea that there are some pretty significant differences in the way different Christians approach this. Catholic, Orthodox, Protestants, you know, within the Protestant faith. The idea of, you know, salvation. Is it entirely an act of God? You know, do you believe in election? Or do you believe in free will to the point that we decide? And that ultimately can have some ethical implications. Because that affects how we approach people with regard to salvation. Okay. Now, particularly, ethical approaches um, amongst Christians vary based upon the doctrinal emphasis. Where do they put most of their weight? And there are five major doctrines that people tend to emphasize. And, and ideally, th these are all real doctrines, and ideally we would all hold them in balance. But the fact is that too often groups of Christians will, you know, denominations or particular churches or teachers, of, you know, they'll emphasize one or two or, you know, more of these more than others. Those doctrines are the doctrine of creation, the doctrine of sin, the doctrine of incarnation, the doctrine of redemption, and the doctrine of resurrection destiny. Let me, let me talk about that for just a minute and then we'll take a break. Creation is, is an emphasis on the fact that at the beginning, God created all things. You know, he particularly created ex nihilo, and he made human beings in the image of God. Now, those who, who maintain, <coughs> seriously maintain the doctrine of creation, believe that God made everything, he owns everything, that, that would affect how people feel about materialism, for instance, ethical decisions about materialism. If, if every person is made in the image of God, that affects how we approach ethical decisions with regard to the value of human life. See? Um, so, in the creation emphasis, doctrinal emphasis, um, that leads, and that does lead us to the idea of natural law. Since God made everybody, and everybody's made in the image of God, whether they realize it or not, then everyone has access to some of the same truths inherent in us. That there is this spark of the divine in all people, whether they recognize it or not. You know, for some people, it's barely there. And then various degrees of how, how bright that flame is burning in people, you know, up to the great saints who truly the relationship with, you know, with Jesus Christ is, is a powerful thing. But creation emphasis has, as you can see, a direct impact on ethical decision making. Sin which is the doctrine of how evil entered into the world, and as a result, uh, how does that affect our intended relationship with God, has a huge deal. We have all probably known of people who had so much of an emphasis on sin, you almost want to say, well, just kill yourself now. Okay, everything is, you know, and this tends to be like among some of the Dutch Reformed people I have known. They said they'd grown up in this. You know, you're a, Lou Smeads, who was my ethics professor in seminary. He's written wonderful books. Lou said he grew up being told, you're a worm, Smeets, you know, uh, that because you're broken, you're a sinful creature, you, there is nothing good in you. So the focus is on sin to the extent that you exclude the value of a human being as being made in, you know, sometimes, to, possibly, can exclude the value of a person made in the image of God, and even the importance of the redemption. <coughs> what do you talk about most is the question there. And so people who, you know, people who focus on the sin part will be quick, quick to point out faults, both in themselves and others. They tend to be more moralistic. That affects our ethical approaches. All right? Incarnation is the emphasis on God coming as Jesus Christ, that God was himself born as a human being, as the decisive act in history. Um, now, that's a statement about God's relationship with the world and with humanity, that God has not abandoned us that he has addressed the, the, the darkness that infects us because of our sin. And um, in that case, the big emphasis is that moral improvement is not the point. Me trying to make myself better isn't the point, that God has been, by the incarnation, has done it for me. Well, the danger <coughs> is if you let that get too loose, then you give yourself latitude not really to have moral, you know, a moral obligation in the same way. You see? No, Jesus came, and so everything's fine. The, the, some of the libertarians that Paul writes against, they basically said, you know, Jesus came and I accepted him, so it doesn't matter what I do with my body. Because I can always go back to Jesus. 
than redemption. Redemption focuses on how God's decision to, to be incarnate in Jesus, how that gets applied to transform people's lives. And a lot of questions come up there. We believe in the redemption, but what's the process by which redemption occurs? Is it entirely God and we just get picked out without, you know, without us having anything to say about it? Or do we have to then be involved in the process of the redemption? Is it something that we have to contribute to? And so you get Arminian theology, which believes that, you know, which I think overemphasizes free will, and some reform theology, which I think overemphasizes election. There's actually a balance in there. We talked about that at Bible study this last, last week. And then resurrection destiny. This completes the Christian understanding of God's relationship to humanity and to history. That began, it begins with the creation. It goes through the introduction of evil and sin, the incarnation of Jesus, the redemption that is made available through Jesus, and then ultimately the idea that we will be resurrected. Now, one thing is that the idea, the resurrection destiny, the assurance that, that God is still involved and will be throughout all time and that we will be part of that, that gives Christians a sense that moral choices are always going to be meaningful. This is not temporary. You know, this is going to continue. And if we believe that these, thought, these decisions, our moral approaches, will last forever because of the idea of us being resurrected in, in eternity, then that keeps us from um, having a tragic view of life. We have to have a more positive view of things if we believe that this is going to lead into an eternity. All right? So hopefully you can see how these five major doctrines, and we are called to believe all of them, and I believe that maturity as a Christian means we hold all of them in balance. But there is such a tendency among particular denominations or religious groups or particular churches or individuals to tend to want to emphasize one or the other. And I think you can see that. Somebody who emphasizes sin is just a sourpuss. You know, somebody who emphasizes the incarnation to the point where that's, you know, doesn't matter what I do, Jesus came. Those kinds of things affect our you know, somebody who believes strongly in the creation that we are made in the image of God will have a different value of human beings than if they hold that creation doctrine as being, you know, much more loose than that. All right? Okay. Let's take a break. Um, we can see how emphasis on different, major emphasis on different doctrines affect the approach that people take in ethics, but... Especially various factors, emphasis, some of the historical backgrounds, what traditions people come from, they affect Christian ethics and actually get reflected in very different stances or sort of strategic approaches related to how we deal with surrounding society, with human efforts, with ethical decisions. And I'm going to give you four of these. You may not recognize any but the last one, and I'm sure, pretty, pretty sure you'll understand the last one, but I'm going to give you a little history on that so that you understand how well-meaning, you know, um, thoughtful Christian people can vary in terms of where they emphasize things. Um, all Christian, I believe all, well, all Christian ethical philosophers or theologians come from the background that Augustine really laid the foundation for. Um, and so they have that in common, but at various times with various emphasis and other historical kinds of things, they've taken divergent roots and tend to always point their fingers at each other as getting it wrong. The first of these four I want to talk about is called the, the synergy stance. Synergy seeks ways for Christians to work with, uh, with other understandings of human good. This, the a theologian named John Courtney Murray, who lived um, 1904 to 1967, he was Catholic. And during that period of time, he was a major th theologian working to try to figure out how the Catholic Church work, could work in conjunction with the, the more dominant Protestant com, um, society of the United States. You remember, uh, not too, too long before he died was uh, when we elected John Kennedy as president. It's the first time that a, you know, a Catholic president had ever been elected. There was a significant division that was seen between Catholics and everybody else. Um, in, in the United States. And so John Murray, uh, John Courtney Murray drew heavily on the idea of public consensus. That even though we may not agree theologically, I mean, he's coming from the Catholic faith, that we may not agree theologically that Americans had sort of, um, he felt, perfected this idea that we can work with people even if we don't agree with them. And that together our differences can create a kind of synergy 
and that we don't, you know, we don't in the United States, and they often say this when we have presidential election and a new president takes over, that much of the rest of the world looks on us in awe that we have every four years, or if somebody gets reelected every eight years, we have a complete transition of authority without violence. You know, that really is pretty rare. And so because we are able to do that in America, John Courtney Murray said that American democracy is the model by which we can identify the, the ability of Christians, of even, even Christians of different traditions, and non-Christians to work together as a society to make good ethical decisions on what is the best, best direction. Okay? So that's synergy in the simplest possible way. How Christians can work together with others with other different kinds of understandings for the common human good. The second is called integrity. Integrity is almost the opposite of synergy in some ways because it emphasizes a maintenance of a distinctive Christian witness. One of the primary uh, writers in this field is Stanley Hauerwas. He had a lot of different... His Christian outlook was influenced by a lot of different... Um, influences. Uh, Mennonite, various other Protestant, he taught at a Catholic school for a long time, and so he had all these different pieces, and it brought him to the point of saying that there has to be, there is, and has to be something distinctive about the Christian witness and the Christian approach to ethical issues. That it needs to be, and he, in fact, this, some of this comes from his sort of uh, Mennonite and pacifist background, that given the opportunity, the government or any forces, any of those authority <coughs> figures that are in power will use force to get people to concede to what they decide is the right approach. And so therefore, the goal is not synergy of figuring out a way to work together, especially with political forces, but rather that we have to stand apart and declare that Christianity is different than the way the world does things, different than the way anybody else does things, and we therefore have to have a unique and distinctive kind of witness, and that that needs to be reflected in how we approach ethics. So you see the difference in those two. <coughs> Almost the opposite, but both of them are very significant in a lot of approaches. The third is realism. Realism really uh, warns Christians against overestimating their own power and their own value. Probably the primary theologian in this, which is one of the primary theologians of the 20th century, was um, Reinhold Niebuhr. Niebuhr really maintained that our biblical ideal of love, our Christian ideal of love, needs to be balanced with the biblical recognition of human nature, that we are broken and fallen creatures, and given the opportunity, we will do awful stuff. And so Niebuhr's realism basically recognizes the effect of sin and weakness on human nature, that it's found everywhere, and his realism warns us against our tendency to overestimate our power to control events and to think too highly of our own virtues. So Niebuhr and others as well, although he was the primary one, really focused on being realistic about human nature and that there was a limit to what we could do because we're just not that good. <laughs> and that our ethics have to be tempered by that realization. And given the opportunity, people will do evil. Um, in fact, have a greater tendency to do evil than to do good that too many of us aren't really motivated by the love of Jesus as much as we should be. Okay. And then the fourth one, which is the only one you may have heard of, I don't know, is liberation. The focus of the liberation stance, or liberation theology as it became known, is a stressing of the freedom from oppression that is central to the Christian message. This began, um, the civil rights movement reflected this a great deal, and then from some of the early civil rights things, it, it became a major theme in Latin American theology because of the number of dictators and various other, the Pinochets and various other things were happening there. It affected a number of places in, in Asia as well. And it provides, liberation theology or the liberation stance, provides a perspective that Christians are necessarily supposed to be involved in political struggles to bring freedom from oppression. And they look to Jesus and say, you know, freedom from oppression is a major thing that Jesus talked about. Whether the, those who are oppressed, it's because they're poor or they're hungry or they're enslaved or whatever it is. And so their primary emphasis became this idea that if we are to be reflective of the incarnation and be redemptive forces, we need to apply that 
to oppression as it exists around the world. Now, most of you have heard of liberation theology, right? Mm -hmm. um, in every case, whether we're talking about uh, synergy or uh, integrity or realism or liberation, almost all of them look at the others and say, you've gone too far. <coughs> See, all of them have something to, to recommend them. There is a sense in which all of them have elements of truth. And yet, the tendency is for integrity, for instance, to insist that, um, that synergy is compromising the faith for the sake of expediency, and that I, realism denies the teaching of Jesus because Jesus completely redeemed, and so therefore our failings are not the thing that should, should be our, our primary focus. Synergy and liberation are always accusing each other of forgetting what the true meaning of the Christian faith is. It's not just making an expedient sort of compromise with people. Um, it is to be a radical force for, for freedom and release from oppression. So you can see how these stances, similar to what I said about the five doctrines, that it's which one you emphasize most. These are four major theological stances that developed uh, starting at the end of the, the 19th century and throughout the 20th century that have a very different Christian approach to how we value people, how we make ethical decisions. Is that clear? My point in much of what we're talking about today is it's not as simple as saying, well, let's follow the Bible. Let's do what Jesus said. A lot of very committed, very you know, godly, very smart people have had very different ideas as to what that means in terms of how you, you live it out. Okay? Um, so, understanding that we, we all have a particular point of view, we have to realize that having a particular point of view, whether it just be coming from a sort of Augustinian Christian perspective, uh, or based upon what the Hebrew prophets said and what continued in Jesus, that's not exactly the same thing as solving a moral problem. When you are conf confronted with a specific decision, how do I decide what to do in this situation? The moral question, after all, isn't what should I believe? That's not the question of morality. That's the question of theology, but it's not the question of morality. Morality is more specific than that. It asks, what should I do? And how do I decide what I should do? Now, when I gave you that list, um, synergy, um, ideal, um, integrity, uh, realism, and uh, liberation, they have all focused in a particular area in terms of saying, here's what I should do. You know, liberation says what I should do is everything in my power to free people from oppression. Synergy says I should do everything in my power to find ways to work with other people, even if they're not Christian. You know, realism says I, what I should do is not get too carried away with believing that I got all the answers, but rather that my human brokenness has to make me humble, you know, etc. Integrity says that above all, we need to stand out as a light in the world and not be drawn into it with everybody else. So, what should I do? The real question of morality and ethics is affected by the stance that we take. And so, we really get to the primary topic for today, <laughs> and that is, Christian ethics comes into conversation with other ways of thinking, but all ethical approaches, whether Christian or not, use one of three, one or more, it's possible to have pieces of each, one or more of three primary ways of arriving at moral decision. And I talked about this, the first of this course. Teleology, which means goal-oriented, what is going to be the result? And I make decisions based upon getting the best result. That is the result for good. We're assuming that there's a moral value in that, not just I'll get more money. You know. um, deontology, which is duty or rule-oriented, there are certain things you should do and certain things you shouldn't do. There are rules about that, whether it be the law or whether it be just a sense of common decency. You know, that's just not right. Some, some people would say they have an inherent sense of that in certain cases. Difficult to say in all cases. Or a retheology. You don't need to keep using that word from here on out. I will call it virtue ethics or virtue oriented. A retheology comes from the word aretes, which means virtue in Greek. Um, so these goal oriented, duty or rule oriented, or virtue ethics oriented. Those are the three ways that we can approach that. Um, <coughs> yeah. And the teleology, then, that's where um, the end justifies the means. That's correct. The extreme version of that is the, the end justifies the means, whatever the means are. You know, um, 
and that actually gets to some of the questions that I asked on the first first time we met. What I, you know, the, the fat man conundrum, which is which is one of the what's called the, the trolley um, problems. If there was one really large, obese, and clearly not very healthy man, the sort of person you look at and go, he's not going to last much longer. And if you knew that by pushing, that there's a trolley, a train, headed toward five children, and they're all going to be crushed. And if you knew that you could push this one big fat guy in front of the trolley and stop it, and then he's going to get killed. But in killing him, who maybe not have much longer to live anyway, doesn't look like he's enjoying his life. If you could make that sacrifice and save five children, is that the right choice? Now, somebody who would say yes, somebody who absolutely would say yes, then that's a teleologist. They would say that saving five young, healthy lives at the expense of one old, fat, unhealthy life is a, fair, is a right trade. Somebody who's a deontologist, who really follows strictly this idea that there are rules, would say, thou shalt not kill. You don't do it. Now, there's, uh, Carolyn sent me an article, I think it was from the New Yorker recently, which this trolley problem, which was, which was coined first time, I think, in the 19th century, um, had, it sort of went out of vogue, and everybody thought, well, that's kind of passe. And then it's come back, and there have been a lot of tests that have been done. And they de they've determined things like this, this trolley problem, that a trolley is coming down here, and um, you can, you know, there's one person on this track, and there's five people on that track, and if you throw a switch, the trolley will change onto the one track and kill the one person, and five people will be saved. Um, and so will you take, same thing as the Batman conundrum, will you do something that would cause one person to die in order to save five? But they've also, and they've tested all that with large groups of people now, they've also tested in such a way that if you don't do anything, that one person will die and the five will be saved. And the thing they have discovered is that when they ask people what they would do, they would give an answer. When they actually put them in a situation where they have a model and the trolley's coming along, you know, and, and, and they have a button to push or a lever to pull, and they actually have to do something that people, what's that? It changes everything. It changes everything. And they, 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 you know, the, the having an action to do rather than just saying words changes it. And particularly, completely different responses when they said to people, if you don't do anything, this is what's going to happen, versus you have to actually do something to change the results. So it's not always as easy as you think in terms of, you know, people think I'm absolutely clear cut on that. Well, again, we get back to the issue of what if the children were yours? And you had, you know, you could push this fat man and save your own kids or your, you know, your sister's kids, whatever. What if the old fat wheezing guy is your grandfather? <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> um, then, what do you, does that make a difference? So there's a lot of different pieces to that. But these three ways of deciding are universal not only to Christian viewpoint, but to all other kind of ethical <laughs> systems. Either you make decisions based upon what you believe the end result will be, and whether that achieves the goals you think should be met, or do you believe there are duties or rules that need to be followed, either that they're articulated specifically, or there's an inherent sense of things you should and shouldn't do, or do you base it on what does that make you as a person? What constitutes a virtuous <clears throat> act? And if you do it or don't do it, what will that mean to you? What does that say about you? And what will that turn you into? Okay, Lydia. Could there be a third one? Instead of pushing the old, the big fat man running from the train yourself. Yeah, the, the, the re reason that's, that's presented as a, a big fat guy is that <coughs> an ordinary sized person would not be of sufficient mass to stop the train. Okay. Yeah, and you know, that's, that's a different question. Would you sacrifice your own life? People are much more likely to say they would do that than otherwise. You know, what's that? To say they would do that. To say they would do you that. You can't really test that. Yeah, you can't test that. <laughs> you know, um, so, teleology. We want to start with the first of these, not because it's the oldest, but because it is the one that is most common in the world today. This idea of, you know, we know um, the ends justify the means. We understand the, the greatest good to the greatest number of people. I mean, Spock, for heaven's sake, said that. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the one or the few. What's that? 
hands in later. Yeah. Um, so, teleological ethics or goal <coughs> ethics, and again, I think it's good, it's valuable for you to learn these words. And the teleology means end result. For instance, in, when you talk about um, arguments for the existence of God, you know, there's a teleological argument uh, for God because it has to do with with what the what the existence of the world as a as a result, how that has to do with um, God. You know, there being a creator. Right? Uh, William Paley, the British theologian who made, who made the first watchmaker argument that because there is an end result, you know, a telos, that is the created universe, that, that argues for the existence of a God. But the same thing as end result, okay, because something is or can be. So teleological ethics uses reason to determine the goals or goods at which our action should aim. Remember, when we say goals, we're always talking in this context about what is a good thing, all right? A good goal, not just, you know, that the Lakers might win tonight or whatever. Something that has a moral value. So what are the goal, goals or goods to which our action should aim and to guide action toward the achievement of that goal? What should happen to be morally right? And then we make a decision in order to try to achieve it. Doesn't matter what rules we think exist, what will lead to the best moral result? But then we have to say, and well, and that includes what makes an action right is that it aims at good results. Right and wrong is based upon end results. The ends justify the means. What makes a person good is that he or she accomplishes good things. So you can see that moral value, either of a, a thing, an action, or a person, is based upon where it will go. What are the goals that will be achieved at that? Now, there are some concerns related to this, and I'm going to come back to that. The challenge in teleological ethics is determining what is really good. Is it just what's good for me or what's good for you? Is it what's good for the most people? You know, it's good for those five kids. Does that mean we sacrifice the old wheezy guy, fat guy? You know, what's really good? Secondly, which of the competing goods are best? You know, if I'm trying to get my PhD, and I know that if I get my PhD, I can make a you know real positive impact on society, but in order to do that, I've got my orals tomorrow, and I really have to study. But somebody tells me they're really struggling, they're really having a hard time about something, and they want me to spend time with them tonight. And I've got my orals tomorrow morning. Which is the greater good? All right? Spend time with somebody who's hurting, or study for my orals knowing that I, if I do well, then I could do a lot, a lot of good beyond that. Which is more important? Um, I've got a job and I'm making good money, but it takes a lot of my time. And so because I want to be able to put money aside for my kids' education, I want to be able to provide well for them, I don't spend time with my kids. And they're really missing having me around. You know, I'm not really providing the family environment, but I'm doing it because I really do want to help them, which is the greater good. Okay, what's best? And then, how accurately can we predict the future? Because remember, we are making moral decisions now based upon what will happen, what goal will be achieved. How accurate are we that what we think is going to be the end result or the goal achieved is actually going to be the goal achieved? Back to that idea that um, you know, the Greeks agreed that we can't just base our moral decisions on, on what we want, what our desires are, because our desires may change tomorrow or we may get what we desire and then find that it wasn't what we really wanted anyway. There's an example of projecting into the future what the end result will be and then making a decision, a moral decision today. Are we sure that we are accurate in our projections of what might happen? <clears throat> Those are some of the challenges. I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. But in terms of Christian teleological ethics, as I said before, Aristotle said ethics is about making decisions that lead to happiness, eudaimonia, uh, fulfillment. Flourishing. That's the goal that everyone naturally wants. But Aristotle said, you, you don't get there right away. You learn how to have happiness or flourishing or well-being slowly, step by step, based upon experience. Every moral decision you make in that direction teaches you something that allows you to make better ethical decisions tomorrow and a week from now, two weeks from now. And so it is a lifetime process process. 
There is no one, pro one means by which you can know this is the system, and if I always decide, then I'm going to have a sense of well-being, that good will happen. Now, Christian ethics seems to agree with, disagree with that. Jesus said that the blessed or the joyful, makarios is the Greek word in the New Testament. And this is from Sermon on the Mount, of course, blessed are the poor in spirit. Jesus said that the blessed or joyful are the meek, the merciful, the peaceful, and the persecuted. But ultimately, it all depends upon relationship with God. In other words, Aristotle was sort of saying, you're going to get better and better and better. You're going to get more experience, make better decisions, and Aristotle especially dealt with people who were leaders in society. He had this long list of people who didn't really qualify. Women, no, because they didn't have their own money and they couldn't ethical, make good ethical decisions. They could not grow toward happiness by themselves because they were dependent on men. Slaves couldn't because they didn't have freedom to do those things. The poor couldn't because without money they didn't have the freedom to be able to make. So he ended up really speaking to a very small percentage of people. And, but Jesus seems to be saying it's not just the rich, it's not just the powerful, it's not just the people who have freedom. Quite the contrary. The real blessed, the real joyful, those who have a real sense of flourishing, of uh, eudaimonia, may very well be the downtrodden. The oppressed, the poor in spirit. Okay, we got a very different sense of that, and we need to recognize. Now, Augustine comes along, and he emphasizes the uniqueness of God's reality to explain why God alone is to be loved. In other words, he takes the idea that the ultimate goal is is well-being, is flourishing. It's um, he agrees with Aristotle, but he backs up and says, "Wait a minute!" But the only way you get there is by first recognizing that you must love God, as Jesus said, and there can be no other object of your love. No, nothing else can give you true happiness. Is that not the, the biggest failing of our modern culture? If I could just get that, bit, that new house, then I'll be happy. If I could just get that new car, then I'll be good. If I can just get that new relationship, or those Jimmy Choo shoes, or whatever it is, then I'll be happy. Does our culture not do that? Our culture being Western culture? Well, Augustine was big on saying, none of that stuff is going to make you happy. Dominating your fellow man is not going to make you happy. And Augustine went so far as to say, don't love anything else. Because only loving God will get you where you want to go. Um, the old saying, don't love anything that can't love you back, is a good one. All right? Um, Augustine said, uh, let me make sure I get this right, he said, love with care, and then what you will do. That's an earlier version of a famous quote by Luther. Martin Luther said, love God and do as you please. Now that doesn't mean love God and do whatever you want, go crazy, man. What it means is if you start in the right place, if you love God, Augustine and, and Luther are both saying the same thing, if you really love God, Luther was saying, then what pleases you will be pleasing to God. That will affect everything else. That's very much Augustine's approach. Love only God and everything else will fall into place. Augustine said that the things in the world, you should not love them, you should use them as necessary, but always be ready to relinquish them. Because if they ever get in the way of your relationship with God, or secondly, as Jesus said, your acts of moral kindness, generosity toward other people, loving your neighbor as yourself. Now, when I talk about Augustine and Luther and even Aristotle, there is a, a fundamental difference that teleologists, people who follow this goal-motivated uh, ethics, will have. And that's the difference between moral realism and moral idealism. And this comes back a little bit to the thing you, you mentioned earlier, um, Marvin. Moral realism is the belief that goodness or rightness is actually a part of reality for whatever it is that, that we accurately identify as good. Goodness exists independent of ideas we have about it. In other words, I can say that table is white. That is a real property. That is a thing that exists as part of that table. It's not just my idea about it. Okay? These walls are yellow. You know, that cabinet's made out of wood. Those are real properties. Moral realism says that goodness 
is also a real property of people, of actions, of some things. Some things have inherent goodness to them. Now, you, in some cases we could say that the beauty of the mountains is an inherent goodness. You know, there are some things that happen as part of creation, for instance. There is a, an inherent, um, objective, real goodness that is a property in the beauty that exists in the world. There are some things that we say are good because of people's actions. I don't think anybody would disagree that it is a good thing to give food to a starving child. Right? So there are certain things that we would say there are inherently good. And anybody who argues that, no, it's not good to feed a starving child, better have a darn good reason. But some people would. Some people would say, oh, you only create dependency. Well, they live in a part of the world where there's no other options. We either feed them or they die. Okay? Well, Malthusian economics, Malthus was a, a, a philosopher that, that lived a long time ago. He said that people need to die. If they don't, you know, all the rest of us are going to take it. So let them die. Ebenezer Scrooge said that. Too. Ebenezer Scrooge said that, too. Exactly. The other well, great philosopher. I did, I did have a friend, a Christian friend, who was feeding a family. The husband was an alcoholic and not taking care of. He'd come home and pregnant his wife. She had all these children that couldn't feed. And she said, I will feed you. I will bring you food every day. I have one condition, and that is that the children must go to school. Mm -hmm. They didn't go. She didn't do it. She yep. didn't force it. She stopped with the food. But she felt like that was not going to help them. Right. Um, now, I don't, again, that's a big ethical, I don't, you know, and who said she had to feed them anyway? I mean, that right. was her choice. So it's tough. Well, there's a good example where we sometimes find, <coughs> we find goods in competition with each other. All right? right. The, the moral good of feeding a family right. versus the moral good of having the children go to school so that they can make sure they don't grow up in the same situation, that they have a different future. And sometimes we find that those things come in conflict with each other. But the, this is an important one because the moral realism, the idea that there are certain things that are inherently good, is foundational to uh, many religions, especially Christianity, Judaism and Christianity. Because we believe that God is inherently good, that he is the definition of good, and that he is, remember Genesis 1, and God saw what he had made, and he said it is good. That, yes, there's a fall, yes, there's a brokenness that was introduced by human sin, but that there is good inherent. God didn't say, uh, my opinion is that might be good. God said it is good. It was a definitive statement. And so there are things that Christians and Jews, some other religious people, but also non-religious people, who maintain moral realism would say that there is inherent in some things goodness. And it's as real as the material they're made out of or the color they're painted or anything else. It's a real property. Carolyn? I, I keep wondering about um, Islam with the whole fatalism thing. Is that because they think everything that happens must be good because God's in control? Is that... Yes, um, and in that way, their definition of what constitutes good is rather different than right. what ours would be. Yeah. Okay. The, the idea that God's will trumps everything else, that it is the ultimate good, and, and if, if we leave everything alone, then God's will will inherently be done, you know, whereas a, a more Christian, more Western view would be that God uses us as his hands, you know, that if God gives us the ability, the power, the motivation to do something, to intercede from children who otherwise may die from measles or malaria or whatever, then we should do that because God desires us to do that. And this is a very real thing. Carolyn knows, uh, when I worked with World Vision, they were having a lot of deaths from measles, for instance. We think measles is a childhood. It, measles is one of the biggest killers on the planet. Um, and we had children all, all over West Africa who were dying from measles. Well, we would go into, in, in almost entirely Muslim countries, we, World Vision and other organizations would go in and want to, want to immunize children against measles. And some of the imams in the communities would say, absolutely not. Uh, you know, aksala, God's will. If God wills that that child die, then the child should die. You shouldn't interfere. Well, that's kind of fatalism is, does not recognize that God may be using us as tools to do good, but rather that God's will, whatever it is, is trumps everything else. Okay? Well, what it be, what could you say what was God's will that uh, we found the vaccine? Right. I mean, because... Well, and we would... We, that's the sort of argument we made. Five, 
unfortunately, we finally found some very, very influential imams in West Africa who spoke up and said, no, you know, it is God's will that we immunize these children and protect them. And so we were able to continue. But, but as opposed to moral realism is the doctrine or the approach of moral uh, idealism, which says that moral values are not real properties, but rather that they're only ideas that get assigned to things. That something is not inherently good or evil, or good or not good, but rather that individuals or groups decide that something is good, and we assign that label, and therefore goodness is subject to change. Now this is especially evident in those who would maintain beliefs of materialism or idealism. And those two words are virtually the same thing. Uh, materialism is more the philosophy in, in, uh, in naturalism. What did I say? Idealism. Idealism. Sorry. Materialism and naturalism. Materialism is more the philosophy and naturalism is how we see it worked out. But both of them believe that there is nothing beyond the physical world. The physical world is all that is. There is no supernatural. There is no spirit. That is supernatural as opposed to natural. That's where you get naturalism. Materialism. There is nothing beyond the material physical world. Well, those that would believe that, especially some scientists and virtually all atheists, because by definition, you know, they are materialists and they don't believe in the spiritual, um, they would say that the, there can't be anything beyond what's physical. It is the movement of atoms. Everything is. People, trees, everything else. And so, therefore, they have a very different understanding. Since something is not inherently good, their moral decision-making is not based upon any objective kind of idea that it is good to do this and bad to do this. Um, because everything is relative. Everything is just physical. It's just atoms. And so you find that a lot in the, those who are hyper-scientisms, -scient you know, kind of people. Or, um, and, and so therefore, based on what do we say that we shouldn't allow children to starve to death? You know, the, it's sort of a parody of the moral um, idealism are you familiar with the, the A Modest Proposal, which was written by Jonathan Swift, the guy that wrote Gulliver's Travels? There were a lot of very poor people in England at this time, and uh, they were having a lot of babies, which is always the case with, you know, when you have very poor people packed in together to in London. And so he wrote this modest proposal, and it was a proposal that because the people were hungry and they were having too many babies, they should eat the babies. Source of protein? Um, now, it was a parody. He did not mean it, but he, he wrote it in order to make people go, what? what? In order to try to generate more compassion. Now, the, the weird thing is, from a, a moral um, relativism, or moral idealism, you call it moral relativism, in other words, there's no absolute, it's just relative, that would not be unheard of. <coughs> I mean, why not? It's all just atoms, whether they're eating... You know, eating beef, or pork, or cats, or babies, it's all just meat. Because there's nothing that is inherently more valuable than anything else. There is no good. And so, Jonathan Swift's A Modest Proposal, which was a parody, he didn't really intend it, would be very reasonable to somebody who is who does take a moral idealism. That's why, as I say, those who are atheists in the world today struggle very hard to try to say, based on what do we have any morals at all? Since the logical conclusion of an atheistic, materialistic kind of approach is that there is nothing on which you can base a moral decision. So, that's important to recognize. And one of the reasons I'm doing this stuff is I think we need to be able to recognize when, you know, when people are making decisions, where they're coming from. That gives us the ability to communicate with them, to, you know, to recognize where they're coming from, what their motivations are, etc. Now, within um, ethical naturalism, that is, people who don't really see there being a, uh, a god or there being some supernatural, those who are, um, in this case, would take the, that, that kind of approach of uh, moral idealism, one of the most common is utilitarianism. Utilitarianism really came out of the 17 and 1800s. It's the belief that ethical choices can and should be made based upon the greatest good for the greatest number of people, especially the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. So the trolley uh, conundrum, or the fat man conundrum, should I let one person die in order to save five? Absolutely. 
A utilitarian approach would be absolutely. Now, there are a number of names. Francis Hutcheson one of the, uh, was a, a Scottish philosopher, ethical philosopher, who lived in, the, born at the end of the 1600s, lived into uh, middle 1700s. He argued that there was inherent in all people, ordinary people, a moral sense that we could pay attention to. And he said, if you want to know how to make a decision about what will be the, the best, ask an honest farmer. That was his famous statement. Because he believed that ordinary people had a sense of what was right and wrong. And that it would be based upon what was the best good for the greatest number of people. After that, Adam Smith, who wrote The Wealth of Nations, you know, who invented modern econ economics, for instance, he argued that social goals should be established um, by the goods that people buy in the market. The idea of a market economy. That what people invested in, what they bought, what they wanted, was the thing that would really drive the, the greatest good for the greatest number of people. The invisible hand, right? What's that? The father the invisible hand. Right. That people would make the decisions based upon this motivation that they have behind them. Uh, Jeremy Bentham comes along. He and John Stuart Mill. Jerry, Jeremy Bentham is the one that really argued that personal and political choices <clears throat> should follow the principle of utility. That is, what's going to work best? What's the best result? Well, people had a lot of trouble with Bentham because they started asking, well, what about self-discipline? What about sacrifice, self-sacrifice? What about respect for authority? Who decides if everybody makes this decision for themselves? And Bentham especially believed that Christians were too dull to get this. You know, they couldn't understand this. Well, one of Bentham's students was John Stuart Mill, a name that's probably the most familiar of all of these other than Adam Smith. He developed <coughs> utilitarianism as a philosophy, both for democracy and for social reform. And he actually thought that utilitarianism was the best and most appropriate application, uh, application of what Jesus intended, the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. He thought utilitarianism was a, was a practical application of that, and that is do what's the best for the most people. He thought that was an extension of the golden rule. Um, now, this does not address the issue of what is the greatest good. You'll understand there's no sort of objective value. There is no inherent good. It's whatever's going to work out best. With no idea before you make a particular decision that this is good, this is not good, so we need to go this way. Well, if the, if the most people are benefited in the most way, then that defines what is good the greatest good, the highest good, rather than there being an objective kind of moral good that exists out there. Another name for um, this approach is consequentialism. I used that early in the class, which is simply a, another name for teleology in which ethics is evaluated based upon projected consequences. That's why consequentialism, what are going to be the consequences or results of this? And that comes down to the ends justify the means. Now, there are several versions of all this. Psychological hedonism is the claim that, the, that, as a matter of fact, all human beings seek pleasure. Ethical hedonism is the thesis that pleasure is, not if, is the highest human good. Um, and by the way, uh, Hannah Arendt, we've talked about her before, she falls in here in terms of uh, ego, egoistic hedonism, and that is doing what is best for me, you know, quite plainly. Um, and then the principle of utility, which Bentham and John Stuart Mill advocated, the suggestion that an action be evaluated based on whether it will increase or de diminish happiness, but then you get the question, what is happiness? And whose happiness? Who are we making happy here? Is it the most people? Well, you know, are we prepared to make a decision that will bring a moderate good to a bunch of people as opposed to an ultimate good to one? See? Do we say... Do we save one person's life, or do we keep 20 people from being, you know, severely uncomfortable? What's a higher value? Okay. Do we do we feed people, or do we have a hospital to relieve pain? You know, do we keep feed starving people so they don't die, or do we relieve pain? Those kinds of things, the principle of utility, it's very very difficult to apply it in those cases. Um, there is a version of utilitarianism that is quite Christian, which is called agapism, agapism, based upon agape, which is the, the godly love that Jesus talked about. Jesus said we should, we should give love to God and to our neighbor, 
And so Joseph Fletcher was a, a, a professor at the Episcopal Divinity School in Massachusetts in the, from 1905 to 1993 he lived. And he said we should make ethical decision based upon what is the most loving thing possible. He actually is one more than anybody else that introduced the, the idea of situational ethics. Now, interestingly, he did it from a Christian perspective. He said, how do we show the most love? Because Jesus said, love our neighbors as ourselves. Now, he was pretty widely criticized for this situation ethics, and most Christians who have heard situational ethics, they think it means entirely the end justify the means, no matter what. You know, even if it's doing a terrible thing, if the end result is going to be good, then you know there's no rules. Um, he actually meant it as a positive thing, and out of that we get agapism, the idea of showing love. But he, um, Fletcher's idea was based upon what's called act teleology, that our actions affect the end. You get somebody like um, William Paley, who came up with the watchmaker analogy, and he focused on what he called rule teleology, that what rules should we follow? Not what acts should we do, that's act teleology, and that was Fletcher and agapism. But what rules should we follow that will give us the best results? That's called rule teleology. People were very critical of Fletcher because they believed that while he was trying to avoid legalism, he was accused of antinomianism, which means that the idea that there's no purpose or established principle to guide us, that it's all sort of a free-for-all. When he actually was trying to find a better way to be, be obedient to Jesus, but he sort of launched some things in the wrong direction. Now, I mentioned the fact that atheists tend to not have any rules. A real example of that, and he's considered one of the new atheists, and his writing is, is quite popular, is a guy named Peter Singer. You ever heard of him? He's a contemporary consequentialist ethical philosopher who is an atheist, so he believes there is no God who creates an objective good. So there is really no order in nature to teach us that one good is better than another. So there's really no basis for calling anything good. He's an ultimate idealist in that regard. No God, no one thing can't be said as being better than another. There's no order in nature. And so therefore, there's no reason to prefer human happiness over the happiness of any other creature. If you had the opportunity to save 10 cows at the expense of one human, he'd say, that's the right choice, save the cows. Because humans are just, we're just atoms like those cows. They're sentient beings too. They have, they have a sense of, they feel pain, they're aware of these things. And so Singer is one of those who says, there is no room for believing that my own good has any precedence, or that um, the good of my country, or even the good of my species, is any more important than the good of any other sentient creature. I know Carolyn's friend one time said that you know if she she was concerned that that maybe because she you know she comes from a new age, and she said if I I'm concerned that if I knew that I either had to could hit a tree and kill the tree in my car, or run off a cliff and kill me then I probably, th I think maybe I should run off a cliff because better I die than I kill that tree. Okay, that's an accurate representation to me. Um, and that's, Singer would say the same thing. Okay, that any living being is equal to any other living being because we're all just molecules. Is there nothing beyond the material world to tell us that anything has more value? Singer therefore absolutely advocates that suicide and euthanasia are good things and are preferable to any kind of suffering. Now interesting, Euthanasia. I'll mention one thing, I'm going to close real quickly here. You may not be aware of this. In 1984, the Netherlands passed a law making physician-assisted suicide legal. The Hague, not too long ago, issued a report that said, the Hague, you know, the international courts in, in the Hague, a report that said since 1995, 3% of all deaths in the Netherlands, 3 out of every 100, were physician-assisted suicides. And 20% of those were involuntary. Doctors making decisions to kill people without consulting the person they're going to kill. And it's legal, and it's happening. And Singer would say, well, yeah. <clears throat> Doctors are scientists. They make the decision better to end this person's life than, you know, than have them suffer. If I ask them, they might decide to try to stick it out. And that's not really the best thing. So I'm going to just give them the injection, and they'll die. So, one in five of the 3% of all deaths, so almost 1% of all the deaths in the Netherlands since 1995 have been a, a physician deciding 
unilaterally that they're going to kill the patient and it's legal. That's where that kind of thinking takes us. Okay? So, teleology uses reason to determine goals or goods at which our actions should aim to guide action toward achieving a good goal. But what makes the action right is that it aims at a good result. What makes a person good is they accomplish good things. But the questions are, what is really good? Which of the competing goods are best? And how accurately can we predict the future? Because we're making a decision now, a moral decision, based upon what we think is going to happen in the future. There are serious problems with this. You know, do we do a great good for one person or a moderate good for many people? All right. Um, and Joseph Butler, after some of the early utilitarian writers in the early 1700s, he said one of the problems is that happiness is not something that is achieved by pursuing it directly. <laughs> Good is often a side effect. And you, the problem with utilitarianism is it decides what is good and it goes after that, and we often don't know. By themselves, goal-oriented ethics is not adequate. It is valuable, but teleology by itself is not adequate. Just look at the mess that is Peter Singer, the philosopher that you know, believes that trees are, you know, cows are as valuable as people, and that, you, <coughs> that suicide is a great thing, or the doctors in the Netherlands. Okay. I always wonder about those people, about if it was applied to him. Oh, exactly. Right. Yeah. Right. I think that's a great thing as long as it's somebody else. Yeah, well, that's the thing. Yeah. I've gone over. Any last questions? Anything? All right, no class next week. We will meet again in two weeks. That's only for this class. The other classes will still meet next week. All right, thank, thank you, everybody. everybody.